Welcome, everyone, to Bowers House Podcast, Episode 6. And today, our guest is Jeff Steitzer, who is a voice actor, a stage actor, and director, who is best known for his voice in the Halo franchise as the multiplayer announcer, a.k.a. The voice of God. Jeff, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Alex. Thanks for asking. Jeff, I have a very important question to ask you. Sure. Have you ever played the game Wordle that everyone's been going nuts about? No. 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 I don't do those kinds of things. I, I, you know, I passed on Candy Crush, all of those things. It's like, I've got other things to do with my time. And you know, I feel the same way. My fiance's crazy about it. And she's really been trying to push me to play this game, uh, which understandably, because everyone really has been enjoying this. It's like a mystery word every day. And you have like six chances to guess it. And uh, so it's like, is it like, uh, um, what is that? Uh, Vanna White show. Is it like that? It's like... Uh, I don't know if it's really similar to Wheel of Fortune, but it's more of like you get these guesses at this mystery word. And with each guess, it kind of helps you to get to that, whatever that word is. And then people upload their results on social media and they're like, that so, I've seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I found it fascinating that the guy who made it, uh, Josh Wardle, his name is, he made the game for his wife. Like he, oh. he wasn't even intending to make it for the masses, but then it spread like wildfire. And then the New York Times bought the game from him. It, it's just unbelievable. Oh, I did not. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Talk about. No, a- I don't play. I don't play games like that actually very much at all, just because, um, you know, I try to be a little bit careful about how much time I spend on social media. Um, because there are so many other things I'd like to get accomplished in my waning years. You know, I just turned 70 years old, um, in November. So, um, you know, I'm suddenly thinking, oh, okay, well, I guess it's time to get around to all those big books that I always thought I would, you know, sit down and read, uh, as well as all the other things I want to do, you know, with whatever time I have left. So I'm, I tend not to do that or go down too many, rabbit holes with whatever the popular TV series is right now. You know, I mean, uh, there's just so much stuff that is really, really fantastic. It's an abundance of content now. It, totally. It's, it's totally. just too much. It, we, you have stuff yeah, on YouTube, is. Netflix, all these things that, you know, you. I, I find myself just scrolling through things. I'm like, I, I can't even decide on anything. It's, it's overload, sensory overload. Yeah, yeah. No, I've got plenty of ways to uh, pass the time as is. Do you play Wordle? You don't play Wordle yet. I, I have not uh, caved in to the hype just yet because I'm afraid uh, I'm going to get hooked on it. That's the problem. Th- then I'm going to wonder, you know, okay, what's the mystery word today? But you know what, Jeff? I think it would be amazing if they hired you to voice each Wordle word every day. You know, when they find out what that word is, your voice just, the the multiplayer announcer voice will just pop up and just say, I think that would be fantastic. I'm available for just about anything. So yeah, they're more than welcome to get in touch with my agent. That would be hysterical. (laughs) Right. That would be hysterical. I mean, you know, my very good friend, Jen Taylor, of course, is Cortana. And when she got the job to be the, voice of whatever phone she's on is it the android i think makes sense i guess right but um you know it was kind of like oh that's pretty cool chris who wants to listen to me you know do that voice all the time for directions and you know buy eggs you know <laughs> that would be fun but uh yeah i remember thinking oh that's pretty cool but she she spent a lot of time recording all those things that she had to record that's a lot of work did you meet Jen when you uh, first um, worked for Bungie? No, I've or... known I've known I've known Jen uh, for a long, long time, longer than that. Actually. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, we uh, she was an actress here in Seattle, and in addition to being an actor myself, I'm also, as you mentioned, 
a director and um, we worked together as director and actor on several projects and she's absolutely fabulous. And we got to be great pals. Um, and then, you know, we both ended up being cast in Halo. In fact, I remember at one point when the first game was recording and I hadn't been called in yet to record, I got in touch with her and I said, have, have you been in yet? And she said, oh yeah, I did all my stuff. It's like, huh. <laughs> and eventually that got sorted out but right yeah so yeah i've known her for a long long time and we you know she's really busy right now she's in a play here in seattle a new play at a contemporary theater and then of course the series that she is in the halo series is dropping in march i think after yeah. which i think it's going to be really hard to get a hold of her Oh, I imagine, she's yeah. going, oh, no, no, it's not going to be that big a deal. It's like, no, I think it's going to be an incredibly big deal for you. Um, Absolutely. So. Yeah. yeah, she's super talented. Like her resume of uh, like she's been in so many. She's worked with Nintendo on several games Absolutely. and uh, just uh, just amazing. And uh, that that uh, Halo series is looking to be just fantastic it looks like it's going to be very faithful to the game and uh you know i i heard you mention that if they did reach out to you that you would love to provide a cameo which i i would hope that that happens i don't think that's going to happen i mean the other problem with something like that is you know where they film it's like in budapest or something it's over in europe eastern europe someplace so uh, I remember talking to Janet at one point. She was sitting in a hotel room. She couldn't go anywhere because of COVID. Right. So, you know, she would go to the set and, uh, you know, wearing one of those little suits, you know, with all the dots and everything on her so they could motion capture her. Um, and I, I thought, oh, yeah, I, I don't like to fly that much anyway. And only to sit in a hotel room and sort of be dragged out for whatever you're going to do. Now, she was there for you know, quite a while mm, um, yeah. and will be there, I'm sure, for many seasons to come. I have no doubt this thing is going to be huge. Oh, so, yeah. but yes, yes, of course. If they approach me about it, absolutely. You know, I'm sure Steve Towns feels much the same way. It's got to be a little bit strange to hear Pablo Schreiber doing his best Steve Downs impersonation. Right. Which you know, is, is kind of what we got. It's funny you mentioned Steve Downs because I... <laughs> I had heard on a, a recent podcast appearance that you you had met him up until recently, right? No. Um, it was interesting because, um, like a lot of people, you know, this is a little bit like what happens with all those folks that say, you know, we went in to record for an animated feature and I didn't meet my co-stars, the people I actually interacted with until I was on the red carpet. Well, that was that's been the case with this. When right. you go in to record, you record for the most part on your own, and then they put everything together. Yeah. And obviously, you know, my function is I'm not sort of part of the story in the way that Steve and Jen are, or any of my other pals, you know, David Scully, all those people who've been doing it from the very first game. So I'm just in all by myself and rarely see anybody else. Not only that, I'm rarely told what's going on in the game. So, you know, like everybody else, I have to wait until it comes out to, comes out. oh, that's why they had me say that. Zombies. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> you know, um, but otherwise I wouldn't have known that. Um, so, yeah, what happened was it was in 20, <clears throat> 2020. Yes, I was out there to record in a studio in Kirkland, Washington, which is one of the suburbs. And um, I walked in and Steve was there. I tried to meet him. A couple of times when I was in Chicago, he's no longer in Chicago, uh, but he's, you know, been in the voice uh, over business there for years and years and years. And I've got a very good friend who I generally stay with there who also does voice work and she knows Steve. And so she tried to set it up, just didn't work out. So I was out in Kirkland. I walk in and it's like, hey, come and meet Steve. It's like, you bet. And uh, so we had a chance to chat a little bit. He was working. Yeah. Um, and uh, Jen, of course, was there doing stuff as well. So and Steve stand in for uh, or the person who does all the physical motion capture stuff for Master Chief was there. It was really fascinating. 
um, to meet all the people, really. Isn't Kirkland gorgeous? I, I went there for the first time last year because my fiance's really? sister lives there. And oh. I was blown away. Like the the quality of the air there, the lakes, the the hiking. I love hiking. And uh, my fiance and I are dead set on moving to Seattle at some oh my point. Gosh, that's great. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the only problem with Seattle, of course, is so unbelievably expensive. Yes. And it's yes. driving more and more people, you know, further and further or you know, out of the city or just altogether out of the area. It's just, it's really gotten outrageous, unfortunately. Um, and we'll see if that changes. But it's, there is so much that is good about here. Every once in a while, I fantasize about moving back to the Midwest where I, you know, grew up. Um I've grown up in several places, but, you know, the formative years were in Iowa. And I think, oh, I've got so many friends back in the Midwest, in Minneapolis, South Dakota, I've got relatives, Wisconsin, I've got relatives, tons of friends in Chicago. You know, it could be really great to live in the Midwest. And then I think about winter. And then I think <laughs> yes. about summer. Yeah. Heat and mosquitoes and humidity. Oh, uh, yeah. Maybe that. So... That's this that's what I'm in the heap of in Georgia is, is when the, the summers here kick in, it is like a nightmare. Nobody wants I've to be directed, outside here. I've directed in Georgia at the Alliance on a couple of occasions. So you were born in Deadwood in, in South yes. uh, South Dakota? South Dakota. I was born in Deadwood. Uh, we were there for six months. Then we moved to Sioux Falls. I don't remember it at all, although I've been back many times. I always stop. Uh, when I go through, you know, for sentimental reasons. When I was a year old, we moved to San Diego. And that's when I began to remember, you know, my childhood. And we were there until I was 11 years old. My father had wanted to be a sports announcer. And um, so he'd come out to California to see if he could make it doing that. Couldn't get a job announcing sports. Tried to be a reporter uh, discovered he didn't like to be one of the first people on the scene at a big, you know, pile up with bodies everywhere. Sure. Didn't like that at all. So he thought, well, what else could he do? And he started selling cars. So he worked for a big Ford dealership in San Diego and eventually moved on to a couple of other places and then decided he wanted to have his own dealership, which he was able to get in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So we were wrenched out of our childhood um, enthusiasms and friendships and moved to Iowa. And it was great because unlike San Diego, Cedar Rapids was the kind of a town where people never locked their doors in those days. Now I don't think you'd do it. Right. But my father would bring one of the cars, you know, off the lot. He drove the cars on the lot, a Lincoln. He'd bring it back and he would leave it in the driveway with the doors open and the keys in the ignition. I'm not sure why he did that, <laughs> but he did. And he never had a problem with that. So for us as kids, it was great. We could get out. I could walk downtown to the library, which once I was old enough, you know, to be allowed to do that, I did all the time. You know, it was great. And then at a certain point, I went to the University of Minnesota for a couple of years, spent more time having fun and being in place than going to class eventually transferred to another college where I kind of started over and eventually got a degree um, in Iowa and then moved out to Seattle at the invitation of a friend. She had originally said, come visit me. I was going to go to Minneapolis because I, I knew, you know, some of the folks there. And she said, come and visit me in Seattle. I was like, oh, okay. So I drove out. And shortly before I was to start my drive, she said, there's a theater company out here called The Empty Space, and they're looking for actors. Do you want me to set up an audition for you? I thought, why not? I'm going to have to do it at some point uh, anyway. And I got out, and I auditioned for the artistic director, who had me come back after a couple of days and audition for the resident company, because it was run as a cooperative in those days at that point. And they said, okay, we'll, you know, we'll add you to our roster of actors. And I had made it clear that I wanted to direct. So I began to do that there as well. I was off and running. That was how it all began. That's amazing. And, and yeah. it's funny how people who live in Seattle will say, like, come and visit. And, and that, that's the trap right there. Because you visit and then you want to stay there forever. And that's exactly right. My impression of Seattle growing up was uh, 
you know, the lie that they told you, oh, you know, it's depressing here. You don't want to live here. You know, it's it's the well, some, this, that, and the other. Some people do find it depressing. I mean, but, you know, compared to almost anywhere else, it's like, okay, we had overcast skies this past week. Yeah. So, you know, we didn't have two feet of snow. Right. You know, uh, in the summer, we don't have temperatures. Usually, we did this year. We were over 100, which was really unusual here. Um, a little bit scary. But it's not like Arizona, where it's 120 degrees, you know. Uh, in comparison to almost any other place I've lived, it just doesn't get a whole lot better. Exactly. This yeah. is a great place to be. It really is. And uh, mm -hmm. it's funny because you mentioned that your father sold Lincoln's and then you ended up doing a voice role for Lincoln cars. No, actually, it was a, a commercial. It was I was on camera. You were on camera for it. Which made it even better better wow uh, yes my father you know all when i was growing up my dad didn't know what to think about me doing theater I, he was a little worried about me um and uh especially i can remember we did oh god an ill-judged production of a midsummer night's dream in my first year of high school um and the fellow who was our drama director was a very very sweet man who you know probably was more interested in costuming than he was anything else and the outfit that he designed for me i had green tights i had a green tunic i was playing oberon the king of the wood sprites they you know we knew it would be lethal to refer to me as the king of the fairies because well you know we were going to perform this in in school right and you know we'd never get out alive so i was the <laughs> king of the wood sprites oberon and i had the tunic and i had a long cape with a huge cowl and the makeup was like i looked like something out of a very bad production of swan lake you know just think about natalie portman in black swan right i mean <laughs> only green not black and my hair which at that time was long ish was kind of you know spray painted silver and twisted all i looked like the dairy cream um you know guy and big green gloves and little booties and stuff and my dad took one look at that and he was like oh shit what's going on <laughs> But oh, then man. in the course of the high school, uh, the second year of high school, we did a production of Camelot and a local community theater decided to have awards, talent awards for all of the high schools. And um, I was nominated for playing Pelinor in Camelot. They wanted to make me the best actor in a musical, but Pelinor doesn't sing. So they thought, well, that's going to be weird. So they created a special category for me. And I was the next to the last award to be given out. That was all well and good. But what made it special and maybe started to change my dad's mind is they had hired Meredith Wilson, the man who wrote The Music Man, right? Wow. Who would, had grown up in Iowa, where we were. He was hired to come, and the first hour of the awards was him sitting in a piano, singing and talking about creating the music man and about his career. And then after a little intermission, he handed out the awards. So when my dad saw me get an award from Meredith Wilson, he thought, oh, well, maybe this is okay. Yeah. Ah, yes. Yeah. He's like, that changed things a little bit. But for the commercial, what had happened was I was hired to be a chauffeur who has nothing to do because the uh, person he works for loves to drive his Lincoln all by himself. So right. it was a series of shots of me being bored and reading a magazine, falling asleep. And yeah, it was great. And my dad was just delighted. It showed it like some on the football games and stuff, you know, it was used there. And so it was the best of all worlds for him. He thought it was great. That's amazing. It's funny because my well, father is, he's retired now, but he sold cars for many years. You're kidding. What kind of cars? Uh, all sorts, Toyotas, uh, BMWs, Mercedes. So he, he was oh, wow. like all over the, the, the map with selling and, uh, wow. Yeah, so when I read about that, I was like, oh, wow, look at that, you know? <laughs> it was sweet. You know, I mean, one of the perks was that I always had a car in high school, you know, if the one was free, and uh, got to take a Lincoln to prom and, you know, all that kind of good garbage. 
And we got to gas up at the dealership where it was free. You know, it was only a quarter a gallon in those days. Amazing. So huh? it wasn't that bad, but, you know, a quarter was something that you didn't come on, you know, come by uh, necessarily every day. So, right. <laughs> yes, very different times. Very different times. Absolutely. And uh, what was your inspiration for getting into acting? Uh, I was a show off um, and I was a clown and um, I had friends who were doing plays in junior high and I used to visit them while they were sitting off stage and, you know, just to hang out. And eventually the drama lady, Mrs. Leona Fawley, said, uh, why don't you come out and audition for a one act play? And I thought, oh, okay. And I did. And I got in for a comic role and I played, it was in a play. <laughs> called No Time for Skirts. Oh, wow. And it was about young people going to like a prom or a dance or something. And I was a handyman who showed up and got knocked out accidentally. And when I came to, I had a line, I can't remember what it was, but it was a comic line. And I remember we did it at a, um, uh, uh, for the whole school at an assembly. Mm. and it brought down the house and I'm lying on the ground. I walk up and I say my comic line and people scream with laughter. And I just went, Oh, okay. <laughs> I like this. And I was off and running and it just, I never stopped. It's, it's been very odd and this is going to sound really conceited and I hope I don't mean it that way, but it's always been fairly easy for me to get up in front of people and do stupid things. <laughs> so, you know, that meant that I was the perfect person to have a career in theater um, because I just don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not easily embarrassed. And it's allowed, especially doing as much comedy as I do, it's allowed me to go bouncing around like a Warner Brothers cartoon character on stage a lot. And, you know, it's it's been fun. I liked it. It was it was better than working, you know? There was that as well. Yeah. Plus, I'm also one of those people who does not mind not being employed because, as I'm sure you're aware, for an actor, you're in and out of work a lot. Right. And you don't know what the future holds, and that never really bothered me. Um, I have so many friends. My ex-wife, who was a wonderful actress, gave it up finally. She She could not handle the insecurity and she didn't like being judged which you are all the time right you know and i just don't care you know really yeah it's it's got to be hard to deal with criticism and the judgment when you when you do any sort of role really uh when I, when i make videos about video games if i get a bad comment i'm like ugh you know, it's really. You always tough. remember your bad reviews. You right. never remember the good ones. It's always like, that son of a bitch said <laughs> this to me. And, you know, it helps to just remind yourselves that in the case of most critics, and I don't even call them that, I call them reviewers, because I think a critic is somebody who's knowledgeable and is trying to understand what the creative team has tried to do, whether they've succeeded or not. Reviewers are, you know, all those nasty people who get on there and are much happier trashing you than saying something good because it's easier. And yeah. you don't take those seriously. Plus, no, you know, no. in so many instances, you know, they they reveal their ignorance with everything they say. You Absolutely. Know. Yeah. It, it, they you enjoy get getting like, a rise did... out of people. Exactly. You know, when you see a reviewer saying something like, why did they take this role? You know, it's like, you do realize they don't necessarily have a choice. <laughs> you know, people have to work. They're thrilled to get a job. Right. What's wrong with you? You know, like we're all sitting around on divans, you know, sipping tea and eating chocolate and going, mm, no, I don't think I'm going to do that part. I, it's beneath <laughs> me. You know, right. it's like, Tremors 12, you bet. <laughs> when do you need me in New Mexico? You know, come on. Yeah, it, it's silly. And, and usually it comes from people who don't dare to do any creative things themselves. Yeah. The, the, yeah. It's easy for them to be like the guy on the chair just watching and saying, you know, ah, 
Why well, is this it's like all the people that? who watch football games and scream at, you know, the players like, you idiot, why did you do that play? It's like, you know, maybe if you get off your couch and, and perform in front of thousands of people and millions watching, absolutely. it's like, come absolutely. On. Absolutely. Silly. I mean, I, I don't know. I think the whole thing, it's our culture is so weird. Yeah. And odd about stuff like that. I don't get it. But And now with social anyway. media more than ever, because now you just have every type of person's opinion out there 24 7 and uh yeah it's it's tough which is why i try to really limit how much time i spend on social media and again you know look as far as i'm concerned anybody who wants to put themselves out there and do something creative it's like great great i'm all for it you know but it doesn't mean that everybody's output is going to be necessarily equal Right. You know, some people do extraordinary things. Other people are sort of like, oh, that's nice, you know, but not necessarily memorable. But, you know, it, especially when people are out there doing it themselves, you would think that many of them would be a little bit more generous about the their peers and the other people who are trying to do essentially the same thing. Sure. You You'd know, think. why not? Yeah, right? be kind. It doesn't hurt to be kind. Like, come it on. It sure is hard to do. No, it isn't. Right. I don't always succeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I think it's a worthwhile thing to aspire to. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I want to go back to your first experiences with acting. And from what I'm gathering, it seems you've always been pretty confident in it. But can you recall a time where you felt nervous or had some form of stage fright with stage acting? Yes. Yes. Um, <clears throat> um, I mean, there's always a, a certain amount of um, nervousness uh, uh, on any first day of a show until you sort of figure out, okay, I'm, I don't suck in comparison to everybody else. Um, I did a couple of Broadway shows and uh, the first was Inherit the Wind with Brian Don uh, Dennehy and Christopher Plummer. And um, I had auditioned for the role I was of uh, the mayor who doesn't even have a name. You know, he's got a wife in the play, but he has no name. So there's not a lot of character there. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? And I sort of based my audition on those wonderful old character actors, Edward Everett Horton and Charlie Ruggles and all those sort of, yeah, oh, 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 yeah, oh, yeah, oh. I was doing a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when I went in for the audition, the director, who I happen to know, is a good friend of mine, David uh, Doug Hughes, David Hughes, Jesus, um, and the casting person, one of the biggest in New York and all the, you know, these people, they, they loved it. And I was like, okay, do you want anything different? Do you have any adjustments? Nope, that's fine. Great. And I thought, oh, all right. I went away, they called me back in and was like, you know, uh, we just want you to do essentially the same thing. And I went, okay. And so I sent him, uh, 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 oh, Matthew Harrison uh, uh, Brady, you know, did that. And again, they loved it, laughed, all that kind of stuff. And I said, any adjustment? They went, nope. I went, okay. And I got the part. So I go in pretty confident for the first day of rehearsal. And, you know, I'm surrounded by 30 other people, many of whom, some of whom I know personally. Uh, many of whom I know by reputation or having seen them. And there, of course, are Chris and Brian. So we get to the read-through and we start doing the read-through and I get up there and go, yeah, uh, the people of uh, uh, Hillsboro or and Christopher Plummer stops me and goes, oh, for God's sake, let's have none of your Abbey Theater shenanigans here. <sighs> The Abbey Theater was the home of the Irish Theater, it was the National Theater, but the Irish actors are notorious scene stealers. So yeah. he was basically doing that. Well, I understood that. I howled with laughter, was laughing so hard I fell to the floor. Oh my goodness. And it released the tension in the room. Everybody else laughed as well. And after I sort of pulled myself together, I looked up at Chris, who was smiling like, oh, okay, he can take it, you know? Yeah. And after that, we went along great. That was a little nervous making. And then when I did Mary Poppins, I had I was a replacement for uh, Admiral Boom and the bank chairman. And so I was, you know, put into it very quickly. Yeah. And that was hard because the dancing that I had to do was pretty complicated. And I didn't have that much. I only had a couple of weeks of prep before I was on wow. in front of people. Um, so that was, yeah. And then once or twice, I've been about to go on stage and not known what I was supposed to say. You know, I'd gotten distracted. 
That's what um, I find. In both instances, I opened my mouth and the lines came out. It's like, oh, okay. But it was, you know, wet your pants time a little bit. Sure. Uh, that's what I find so admirable about stage actors is it's live. It's in the moment. You can make yeah. a mistake so easily and you will not have a second chance at it. You know, as opposed to a voice role where you're in a booth, you can laugh or you you can redo uh, a line. So as that's... we often do, absolutely. But the other thing that it, that's worth remembering is is that the audience wants you to be fabulous. Yeah. You know, they're not sitting there and going, "All right, let's see what you got." I mean, more often than not, they assume that everything they are seeing is exactly what they're supposed to see. Right. So if you screw up a line or you take a pause while you're trying to remember what comes next or, you know, a phone falls off the table or whatever, you know, you just keep going and, and that makes them feel comfortable. So, I mean, you know, you, you can't get too wedded to doing the same thing exactly the same every time. And some actors do and that gets you in trouble. You right. got to be a little bit loose about stuff. Not too loose. You've got to, you know, you've got to give essentially the same performance, but you've got to have a little bit of room to move, I think. And improv is a pretty common thing in, in stage acting, right? Not really. Um, it, it may seem that way. Um, mm -hmm. It's less common, I think, on stage than it is on film or TV where very often, you know, they'll say, well, you know, just say something along these lines. Try something different. Why don't you just make something up? Why don't you, you know, whatever. You'll see a lot of sort of, you know, uh, improvisational rewriting on the fly in film or TV. Not a lot because, you know, certainly in TV, the writers are the power. You know, in film, it's directors. On stage, more often than not, it's the actor because once you're out there, doesn't matter what the director told you, you know, if he said go fast and you want to go slow, who's going to win that battle? You right. Know, you're out <laughs> on stage. It's not like he can stop the show and say, God damn it. You know, I told yeah. you to go fast. <laughs> um, doesn't happen. But, uh, yeah. but on certainly on TV, but the writers are often very open to that. Um, and uh, in many instances, um, I'm just not necessarily that way because I'm a theater actor and it's like, I, you know, I assume the lines, I know the lines were sweated over by the writers more right. often than not. And having done only a teeny bit of writing on my own, I know how I go crazy and, you know, belabor every sentence. And I know writers do as well. So I figure my job is to try and understand why they wrote it the way they wrote it and do it the way they wrote it. Sure. So that's what I think. Too. But a lot of people, you know, are much more loosey goosey. I think it's harder on stage because, as you say, in film or TV, you can do it over again. You know, didn't work, wasn't funny, do it over again. Yeah. You know, think about Robin Williams recording Aladdin's Genie. You know, evidently there are hours of what he came up with because he could. And they didn't have to use anything they didn't want to use. Sometimes improv is used as a way of, you know, if a director feels that it's going to help you work your way into an environment or a situation or, you know, to fill in a relationship that the author hasn't bothered with. I don't think that's necessarily the best use of time. Yeah. You know, um, personally, um, I think the best use of time generally is letting the actors try it as many different ways as possible because you learn pretty quickly oh that's not right oh that doesn't feel right because there could or be like those moments of like it. happy accidents where you know Absolutely. an improv line becomes like a iconic line in a film or in a show and uh, in a film so. more more than on stage because again you know the uh playwrights by contract are supposedly the people who have all the power. They, you know, the Dramatist Guild, their their organization that protects their rights. Basically, you're not allowed to change anything without permission. Right. Um, in many instances, for instance, people have gotten into trouble. Uh, 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 director Joanne Acolytis years ago decided to take Samuel Beckett's Endgame, which has a very specific setting, and set it in a um, an abandoned subway train. 
and it, the production almost got shut down by the Beckett estate because, no, that wasn't what he wrote. Oh, wow. Um, Edward Albee, you know, has had that happen on a number of occasions. Uh, a lot of people think it's really a story about two gay men. And when they've tried to do it that way, they've also been shut down because he said, no, it's not. That isn't what I wrote. You know, right. and I can do that. A lot of people seem to think their job is, you know, to use the script as a template, a starting off point. No, it's that's what we're working with. You know, flesh it's, it out. But it's uh, like it it's like you said, it's they poured their work into it and that's how they want it. Represented. If you think you can write better, go write a better play. Right. But don't, you know, dismantle this one. And make it mean something it was never intended to mean. That happens all the time. I that could see why crazy. film directors are that way too. Where if if an actor doesn't do it in the way that they envisioned, they do get pretty upset because they they want it to be how they want. Well, they so. can take thirty seven takes until they get exactly what they want. Right. They can go in afterwards and loop new line readings into what's been said i'd done a law and order and for purposes of time i had a small role i had three scenes which was a pretty big deal you know uh it's like cool but and they eliminated one of my scenes i was on the stand they didn't need it and they were running over anyway so that affected something earlier and they wanted me to change it so i went in and i just changed the line you know and it yeah. was like you you know it wasn't filmed that way originally Wow. Think about all those Marvel films where they literally are making them up as they're going along. Right. And you find out afterwards, it's like, well, yeah, the Falcon and Winter Soldier was going to be something totally different. <laughs> and they had to, you know, they had to rethink it. Or WandaVision, you know, Catherine Hahn couldn't come back to set because of COVID. So they changed all, it wasn't her, it was somebody else. Um, it was, um, oh, that wonderful oh, person. Oh, uh, you're thinking Darth. of, oh, man. I'm blanking on it too. <laughs> I, I'm blanking on her name as well, but she's wonderful. And yeah, you know, and they just, it's like, well, she was going to have more, but they couldn't bring it back. And Dr. Strange was going to be, I mean, that you can do in film. Right. You know, yeah. you can't do it on stage. I mean, you can rewrite the play or cut scenes or re rehearse, you know, but it's not the same situation. Yeah. And uh, what was it like working with Richard Gray? Uh, in the Nance. Oh, um, well, uh, I love uh, uh, Rich Gray. I, I love Rich. He's a sweetheart of a guy. Um, it was a problematic production, uh, it seems to me, of a problematic play. It's not a very good play, frankly, I don't think. Um, and I don't know why I did it, I guess, because I tend to say yes when I'm asked. Yeah. Um, it was a small theater I'd heard some good things about. And I thought, well, I can sort of support them. The money was terrible. You know, the circumstances were not ideal by any means. But being on stage with, with him was great because, you know, he understood the style of the piece. We're doing vaudeville sketches uh, or burlesque sketches. In the 30s and in New York City, that. right? It was like. Yeah, he got that. He yeah. got that. So, you know, going out there and doing a double act and, you know, and, you know, being talking to each other and, you know, it, he was right there. And, you know, if you had to do uh, uh, synchronized takes or whatever, he could do it, you know? Right. He was great at that. Why do you ask? <laughs> that because that play, was it really trying to bring light to the struggles of being uh, like, a gay performer during those times? Oh, I think so. I think that was exactly what it was. The guy who wrote it, Douglas Carter Bean, is gay. Um, and has written about that and pretty much everything he's written about. I, Well, maybe not. I don't know all of his work. Um, I did another piece he had di uh, done, Xanadu, uh, which again is, you know, never going to win any awards for its script. Um, it's fine. It's fun. People seem to like the Nance, you know, and that was great. But it's weird because when I first went to school, all the plays I did, with very few exceptions, back this is back in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, tended to be 
classics that nobody any longer does. Yeah. You know, Moliere and Ibsen and Shaw and Brecht and nobody does those plays uh, hardly at all. Um, everything has moved toward new work. Now, ironically, when I moved out to Seattle in 1975 because a friend had invited me to visit and then I ended up staying, the company I worked with was predominantly known for experimental new work, new writers, new, you know, really out there stuff. Yeah. So suddenly I became known as a new play person. And a lot of my career was based around either recent new works or entirely new works. And I did a lot of that work. Um, and on the one hand, there's the excitement of not knowing how it's going to work out or if it's going to work out. You know, I mean, it's not, if you screw up Shaw, it's your fault, <laughs> you know, because we know those plays work yeah. or Shakespeare or Ibsen. They're not easy, but they're pretty good plays. Sure. Um, with a new play, you don't, you don't know what you've got until it's in front of an audience. And when it works, then it's a huge exhilarating high. Uh, and when it doesn't work, you know, you sort of uh, um, keep your head down for a month or so, you know, <laughs> right. um, and it's terrible, you know, and it's, it's a horrible thing. So it's been a little bit ironic. And ideally what I would love to be able to do is go back and work on, you know, those great classic works of the dramatic repertoire, because, I think a lot of what they're talking about is just a little bit larger than some of the new work mm -hmm. these days. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, that would be ideal. But, you know, the new work is what's happening. I'm kind of at a point, to be quite honest, where I don't think I'm going to be doing any more stage work at yeah. all. Um, the money is horrible, uh, honestly. And a lot of the people I've had to work with, I've not necessarily enjoyed always, you know, some of them nice people, but you know, you don't necessarily feel confident putting yourself in their hands. A lot of actors these days are very different in their approach. They don't see this as a team sport. Mm -hmm. They see it as an opportunity for them to shine all the time, whether it's their time to shine or not. Right. And tedious. I don't need to put up with that. You know, definitely not. It's just, and then doing it eight times a week, and it's like, and pay for your own parking in Seattle. <laughs> oh man, you know, you yeah. don't pay for your own parking. <laughs> so it's like, wait a minute. So you're paying me badly to go downtown, pay a small fortune in parking every week. Uh uh, no. Sounds tempting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, let me think. Uh, no. So. <laughs> um, now. You've you've covered this topic uh, quite a bit. People have asked you a lot about uh, your, um, pardon your cameo for Tannis, uh, saying trans rights, and that oh. was just it. It was it was beautiful, honestly. Uh, your your genuine response to that request was just great and i i feel like i definitely need to to call attention to it and just say that that was a beautiful thing and and it's gotten a lot of a lot of great press yeah uh, um thank you that's very kind of you to say that um i was asked by that person to say that line that i said but I tend to also talk quite a bit in the cameos that I do. I can't help myself. As you can see, you know, I'm sure you expected to cover a lot more than we're covering, but I won't <laughs> shut up. And in that particular instance, as I was talking, I realized I was getting more and more heated because I, I have never understood and I will never understand, I suspect, why a choice that one person makes has anything to do with anybody else so long as they're not, you know, carving them up and baking them into pies. That, <laughs> right. I think, is a line you don't want to cross. But how you live your life, I mean, I look at people now, you know, and I, the trend right now is that people have like wild hair colors and strange haircuts, and I could be old and grumpy and go, oh, uh, you know, in our day we did, and it's like, what? what's it to me? 
It's right. not hurting me, you know, what people choose to do with their time. It's like, it's not what I necessarily am doing with my time, but so what? You know, if they want to, my sister is a huge fan of Hallmark Christmas movies. Yeah. And she'll sit and all during the season, she will tape them and watch them. You know, her husband just shakes her, his head. Many of them are things she's seen before. She doesn't care. She loves to see them. It's like, fine, who cares? You know, and with personal rights, you know, those people who have struggled, whether they are people of color, where they are, are people you know, who are still finding themselves in terms of their identities, their sexual identities or, or anything. It's like they, they are, they need to be supported. People right. need to be supported, um, not condemned, not, I mean, and the fact that it's being used by one of the two political parties as a club to, you know, rouse their uh, members to anger and fear is to my way of thinking about as reprehensible as it could possibly be. I just sure. think it's odious, odious. Um, that's not what we need. Right. You know, we need to recognize that whatever the external differences there are amongst us, we are in fact all one species. We are members of you know, the, the occupants of a planet in that's in danger. I mean, you know, I, I get very heated about all these things. We need to help each other. Yeah. And also be very good caretakers of this world we live in. We have to do it. And a lot of people want to. Judging people on the content of their character, uh, would be, would be a nice thing to see. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's silly that you just get people that don't want to, um accept these things and um it's it's fear and again it's like i don't know where the fear is coming from i don't know why you're afraid it seems to be you know in almost every instance the person who's upset about it it's their problem it's not the person the other person's problems are the result very often of the people who've been upset who then try to like you know control other people you know i i just i've never understood it I've never, it makes no reasonable sense to me at all. Yeah. Well, you really made Tannis' day with that cameo and, and quite frankly, a lot of people's day for sure when uh, well, the story true, went then, out. I'm blinded. And, yeah. And uh, it it's funny. I stumbled upon another story that I, I had to tell you about that I really loved. On Reddit, someone said that they were out in public and they heard your voice and instantly recognized you and <laughs> went up to you, had to say a little something to you and just, you know, you know, thank you for your role as the Halo announcer and everything. But they didn't want to take up too much of your time. So uh, this particular person walked away. Um, and this is what I loved is his friend went up to him and said, Jeff wants to talk with you more. You know, and he was just so, so happy, so delighted and, and went back to, to speak with you uh, some more. And, you know, Jeff, I got to say that was really great of you to do because you really just you made that person so happy, you know, just just by saying like, hey, you know, showing more of an interest and and wanting to speak with them more. Well, here's why I do it. When I was a kid growing up in Southern California, we moved from, as I said, from South Dakota to California. I remember that I was a huge fan of the Walt Disney movies, all of them, whether yeah. animated or live action or document, I didn't care. And I love the Mickey Mouse Club and I love the Disneyland television series. I was I idolized and in many ways still do Walt Disney. Um and I remember at the time thinking, I want to work for Walt Disney. I want to be an animator. That was what I thought I would do with my life. And it didn't happen. Something else did. But it was ironic that later I would work for the Walt Disney Company when I was on Broadway and Mary Poppins. That was just thrilling. But I, I remember thinking, you know, if I had, I think I wrote a letter. I never got a response. If I had got a response from Walt Disney, it would have made my not just my year, my decade, you know, sure. my life. it would have been incredible. And I thought, okay, there are an awful lot of people uh, for whom my participation in this game 
appears to have been a pretty big deal, you know. And if they want to reach out to me or talk to me or anything, it's like, why not? Yeah. You know, I'm happy to do it um, always. Um, yeah, I, it's 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 so easy to do that. And I mean, I, 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 I'm still sort of surprised when it happens. Yeah. I mean, I think the guy who posted that, it might have been the guy at Apple Store. I'm not sure. But this guy recognized my voice, even under the mask. And he said, are you Jeff Steicher? And I went, yeah, I am. He said, Halo? And I went, mm-hmm. yeah. And he said, oh, my God. Oh, my God. He said, I'm shaking. Wow. And I said, whoa, re- really? You know, but again, that's to not fully comprehend, mostly because I, this is one of the things I've been telling people, Alex, and, and I think it'll make sense. When I record and work on the game, right, I go out to a studio, and those have changed over the years, and I stand at a stand with copy, or these days it's on a screen uh, with a microphone, and generally there are maybe one or there are two other people. There's the engineer, and there is the producer, generally the writer. And I go through all my lines, right? And uh, we do uh, three takes of every line. If they want to go back then and do three more takes, we do that until they've got everything they think they need. I go away months past. Pass. Yeah. Then they call me back in to do more recording. That's what happened with this game. Months pass. They called me in a third time, close to the dropping of this game, and I go in and do that, and then I walk away. I don't have interaction with the fans. It's not like doing a play where people might be waiting at the stage door afterwards. Right. And because it's just a voice, people wouldn't necessarily recognize me. It's not like I'm on their TV. Or, you know, in films, they see, I've done some of that, but not enough where they go, you know, <gasps> he's in this film <laughs> in two scenes of Law and Order, woohoo, you know. <laughs> um, it just hasn't worked out that way. Yeah. So I don't think a lot of people necessarily realize that I'm a lot more accessible than they realize, you know. Yeah. So was, recently yeah. with the cameos, and I also do memo and stuff, it's like people have, I think, had more of a sense that I'm there and what I look like, and that I'm approachable, and a lot more people have. And the thing that has been staggering to me are the stories that they share with me. Yeah. You know, how many people started playing this game, many of them when the first one came out 20 years ago? Um, How many of them, you know, watched their parents play and got turned on by that? Many of them met friends, lifelong friends, people that they were able to stay in touch with during the pandemic, during the lockdowns, when they couldn't go anywhere or do anything. I mean, you just, the ones that kill me are the people who said we had a really rough childhood. Mm. And playing this game and hearing your voice helped us get through. And you go, well, damn, that's a huge responsibility. It's an honor to have been that kind of a part of people's lives. Yeah. Um, And I'm just more and more appreciative of what this whole thing has meant to the fans who are amazing. Yeah. Your voice represents a point in time for so many people, especially me. I, I, I can just, I'm amazed that I'm speaking with you now. It's just, it's so incredible because I, I, you know, was a teenager playing this game and just hearing your voice game over and, and all, all these iconic lines. And uh, it's, it's just amazing. And it's like, we, we spoke about, it's like, you never know until you reach out to people and uh, you know, it's, it doesn't hurt to ask. And uh, it's, it's amazing. And uh, the other funny thing I wanted to bring up is y- you've had some interesting cameos where people have asked you to, say some, I guess you could say some immature type of stuff. And a lot of kids on TikTok are using those lines with layered on top of gameplay of Halo and fooling people thinking that those lines are in the game. 
Really? Yeah. I was on TikTok the other day and I'm hearing your voice uh, from, had to have been from one of the cameos. And they're saying, oh my God, I can't believe they added this line into the game. And uh, Well, it's 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 been interesting because, you know, obviously the way those are supposed to work is that they're personalized. Right. And they're sort of meant to be kept to yourselves, but that has obviously not happened. And the other thing is, is you can never underestimate how little I understand some of the things I'm asked to record. Right. Um, you know, being an old dude and not understanding slang and stuff. Every once in a while I go, you know, that sounds a little suspect. And I'll reach out to folks and I'll say, uh, what does this mean? Right. This, and you know, sometimes they'll fess up and go, well, you know, some people think it has uh, sort of a sexual connotation. And I'll go, uh-huh. And I can't say it. Yeah. You know, because it's like, I, I, obviously the objective is to have fun, to make people happy, but yeah. always to honor this incredible achievement. You know, um, I would not want to do anything that would diminish or be offensive or anything like that. Yeah. So I do try to make it clear that sometimes there are just things I can't do or say. And the things, whatever you may have heard online, some of the things I've been asked to say are almost jaw-dropping yeah. uh, in their uh, graphic nature, or it's like, oh my God, you know. Yeah. Um, and... I've been around the block a few times. I've heard a few things, seen a few things, and even me go, so just shake your head and go, uh uh-uh, uh, uh, nope, not going to do that. So. It, it made me think of how, too, you were saying, like, there were lines that you sort of wished Bungie or 343 put into the game, like, you suck, you know? Like, <laughs> something like yeah. that that never really made it in there that they didn't decide. Well, I mean, the, you know? the point I always make about this is, like, you know, one of my favorite lines is, un freaking believable Well, look what I just said. I said frickin'. Yeah. You know, I mean, that could not be more PG. Um, they made a point of not saying something that would get parents upset any more mm. than they should be upset about their five-year-olds, you know, shooting people all day long. Right. But, <laughs> um, amazing parents. Um, <laughs> but of course, I have no room to talk. My children reminded me recently that I showed them The Exorcist when they were not yet 10 years old. Oh, and it was like, my well, goodness. You wanted to see it. I was just trying to be a fun dad. And they were like, yeah, you should have been a you know responsible father. And I was like, yeah, I guess I probably should have. But um, I can recall anyway. seeing that movie at a young age, too. And it was oh, just oh, jarring. Of to course, see. it's the movies. Those are the movies you want to see. The right? ones where people say, you can't see those. No, you're not allowed to see them. It's why this whole banned book thing is so idiotic. It's like, you don't think people now want to read those books? They right. might never have noticed had you not tried to prevent them from seeing it. Is you it know, like a marketing ploy Amazon. at this point? It's like, hey, if you put your book as banned, then more people are going to want to read it. <laughs> so. Absolutely. I mean, that's a time-honored advertising trick. Banned in Boston. Really? I got to go see it. <laughs> yeah. We got to see what this uh, hype is all about, you know? Exactly. Exactly. But uh, crazy, crazy. Oh man, Jeff. Uh, honestly, I I say this. I got to be honest. I say this for all my guests. But really, with you, I really feel like I could talk to you for hours. And uh, you were just such an easy guest to have on. And uh, oh, so 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 appreciative for your appearance today. And uh, do you have uh, anything to promote or any upcoming projects you're working on? Or? Well, um, no, there are some things that are in the hopper. Uh, I am, um, um, uh, I'm on Cameo. I'm on Memo. People can reach out to me to do recordings for them. Just remember to, you know, be sensible, sensible about what you ask. And, right. you know, uh, that's all. And uh, birthday greetings, anniversaries, graduations, all kinds of e pep talks, um, all that kind of stuff. I'm happy to do those things. Uh, as far as any other kind of work is concerned, I'm I'm I have been offered a show in the fall here in Seattle. A small theater is going to be doing, I think, Volpone by Ben Johnson, the Renaissance writer, and uh, that could be interesting. It'll be again no money, uh, a tiny little theater, but it'll be with a lot of friends, so that would be fun. Um, but also, I just turned seventy years old in November, and 
I kind of feel like I want to, you know, really enjoy my time. I am thinking about doing a cross country drive to see everybody I've ever known. That's exciting. <laughs> uh, relatives, and friends. My daughter lives in Buffalo, New York, and I don't see her nearly enough uh, with her husband and her, you know, fairly new dog, Coco. Um, I saw them on my birthday this year, which was spectacular. Um, want to go back to New York and hang out for a while with pals there, see my brother in Maine, brother, you know, I've got family all over. It'd be, that's, so that's what I'll probably be doing. That sounds so great. I'm around, you know, living my best life while I can, trying to have fun. As you should be, as you should be. And, uh, absolutely. So everyone, thank you so much for listening or watching whatever you're doing. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to rate and review the show. And Jeff, it was an honor. And you're always welcome back on the show. Well, just ask. As we said, it's like... That's you know, the motto that's for today. It. Just ask. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much, Alex. Best of luck, by the way. Thank you. Take care, everybody. 